Texas football tries to kick it back into high gear against Baylor. Texas volleyball wipes another Big 12 team off the block. World Series delivers another top 10 play. All of this and more coming up on College Press Books. Hi, Clark Dalton here again. It's another great episode of College Press Box. Let's delve right into it. Although it's early in the season, this past Saturday's matchup against Baylor was a must-win game for Texas football. The Horns needed to silence a barrage of negativity facing the team after the eyes of Texas controversy. They also wanted to erase the ramifications from two heartbreaking losses against TCU and Oklahoma. Let's head to DKR for the highlights. Tom Herman and Dave Aranda, former college teammates at Cal Lutheran, meeting at midfield. Good for them to catch up, but let's get right to business in the second quarter when things start to heat up. When Sam Ellinger drops back, lobs it up to Tariq Black, catching him in full stride, dashing downfield for 72 yards, the longest pass play of the game. A few plays later, Ellinger fakes to Keontae Ingram, scrambling around, drops it right to Joshua Moore. Four touchdown puts Texas up 13 to three at halftime. The offense is beginning to cook. Third quarter now, a little read option action here. Sam Ellinger bulldozes into the end zone, takes a big hit, but it doesn't matter because he is in. Then a few plays later, Sam looking, looking, looking. You know what? I'm gonna run it myself for the third touchdown of the day for Sam Ellinger. Horns are up 27 to three heading into the fourth quarter. Baylor mounting a small comeback. Charlie Brewer finds Gavin Holmes, but it is too little, too late. As the Horns win 27 to 16, the house is rocking in Austin. On Monday, Tom Herman met the press and discussed the state of the football program. Really proud of our guys uh, for accomplishing a, a lot of the things that we had set out to accomplish heading into the bye week and uh, to, to go out there and execute them uh, in a, a game was important for, for us and our growth and, and our development uh, and really happy and, and proud that we, we got an opportunity to get a win at home. I, I think, you know, we continue to improve uh, as the season goes on. Certainly defensively, I think we've all, at least internally, I, I would hope that, that everybody out there that follows our program has, has seen the same things that we have seen, uh, which is a, a definite improvement uh, on the defensive side. Uh, we certainly took a huge step uh, in the penalty area uh, in terms of not beating ourselves this past weekend. So I, I think we're headed towards our, our A game and, and hopefully we can show up and, and deliver our A game in Stillwater because we're, we're going to need it. We now welcome Matt Marinchak. Matt, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. It was a tipping point for Texas football. What were your thoughts on their performance? Well, I think Texas played an overall good game against Baylor. But with any game, there's always two sides, the good things and the bad sides. Let's start off with the good things that went well for Texas. The defense played very well for Texas. They only gave up three points up until the fourth quarter. And they only gave up 316 yards of total offense. And that's a big win for Texas, considering the past um, few games against Texas Tech, TCU, Oklahoma, they gave up 30-plus points in all of those games. And that's a big win for the defense, because this is a team that – a defense that really need to get their confidence back. Um, the, bye, the bye week really helped sure up some of those things. Additionally, the offense played very well and finally established the run. Um, they had 160 rushing yards as a team collectively. And the team played a cleaner game. They only had five penalties. Um, but, of course, as in any game, there are a few things that need to be worked on. Um, they need to stop giving up big leads they had. They were up by 24 points most of the game. But a little comeback by Baylor in the fourth quarter led Texas to only win by 11. Um, you got to work on those. you got to stop those momentum runs for the other team. And they also need to take care of the football and not have costly turnovers. Um, Sam Elgar threw a interception that seemed pretty forced when they could have ran the ball and that ended up letting Baylor score a touchdown to bring the game closer. I know I said earlier they clean up penalties so there are some um, pointless penalties that they need to clean up. Um, two weeks in a row two weeks in a row um, captain Derek Kerstetter has had an unfortunately conduct penalty and that's something that's just really detrimental to the team. They just need to clean that up and they should be good to go. 
Absolutely, Matt. Cutting down the penalties is crucial. In the game against Oklahoma, Texas had 10 penalties. Against Baylor, they had five. That helped them execute much better. Also, we're starting to see the defense improve, which is promising. There are always stars like Sam Ellinger and Joseph Asai who shine on a weekly basis. But the Longhorns need more juice to turn things around. Who stood out to you in Saturday's game? Um, there's two guys that stood out to me. Um, you already mentioned one of them, Sam Ellinger. Ellinger once again led Texas a victory with his great performance. He threw 270 yards and a touchdown while also having 51 rushing yards and two touchdowns. And the offense lives through Sam Ellinger. For, this, for the complete um, season so far, he accounts for 86% of the team's total touchdown with 24. And the second standout player is Joshua Moore. Joshua Moore in this game only had two catches for 45 yards and a touchdown. But he had that massive 37-yard game where he mossed the Baylor defender, and that led to a Texas touchdown. Every week, Moore and Ellinger establish a better trust. It keeps making big plays for Texas. That's why he leads the team in receptions, yards, and touchdowns. Moore and Ellinger are definitely becoming a dangerous combination like we saw with little Jordan Humphrey in 2018 and Devin DuVernay in 2019. You have to love the athleticism you're seeing from him. This game was filled with pressure, but the Oklahoma State game will be magnified by at least times 12. The Cowboys are the number six team in the country and at home. What does Texas need to do to walk away with a victory? Texas needs to do a lot of things, but I think most importantly, they need to contain Oklahoma State's offense. Chuba Hubbard and Tyler Wallace are both explosive players that could have went pro last year but came back to college. And they lead OSU in rushing and receiving, respectively. As a tandem, they account for 53% of OSU's total offense. And if Texas doesn't contain them, they will be in trouble. But if they do contain them, Oklahoma State doesn't really have any other weapons on their offense. Um, their next leading receiver only has 100 yards compared to Wallace's. 408 and they also play with they're playing with a backup quarterback and if Texas could exploit that Texas could cause all sorts of havoc for that quarterback and that offense and on the other side of the ball Texas needs to play good fundamental offense they need to establish the run game early with Keontae Ingram, B. John Robinson, Roshan Johnson and when Sam needs to run let him run don't have don't let him throw it away just have, let him run because when Sam runs the ball Texas does some special things and lastly they need to play some clean football they need to Limit the penalties and limit the turnovers. Couldn't agree with you more, Matt. When Sam Ellinger starts running, that's when this offense gets off to a quick start, and that'll be crucial in Stillwater. Also, limiting Chuba Hubbard and Tylen Wallace always help. Thanks for your in-depth analysis of Texas football. When we come back, the number one volleyball team in the country steamrolls the Big 12. Stick around. You won't want to miss it. Volleyball celebrated Asia O'Neill's birthday. They also celebrated two straight sweeps against the Texas Tech Red Raiders on Thursday and Friday. The team's hitting percentage was excellent, with 462 in their first outing and a season high 483 Friday. Logan Eggleston was stellar, registering 33 kills over two matches. Freshman Nula Yosia also had one of her best games on the 40 acres thus far with five aces. We now welcome our volleyball analyst, Hannah Burbank. Hannah, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. Great to hear. This Texas volleyball team is a treasure trove of talent where anyone can step up. Who stood out against Texas Tech? Well, you can't talk about Texas volleyball and not mention Logan Eggleston's name. She tied her season high with 20 kills in Thursday's game. She led the team with 13 kills in Friday's game. She's just a dominant player and leader for Texas. Then Jenna Gabriel had a great performance as well. She had 38 assists on Thursday and 30 on Friday, and she's really been working on establishing the middle early and getting that right side involved instead of being so left side heavy. And she did a great job at executing that. And finally, you mentioned Nilani Yosia had five aces. She has a killer jump serve that there's really no stopping her when she finds her groove. Absolutely. Logan Eggleston is in that conversation every year for All-American Honors. She's just simply one of the best players in the game. And Jenna Gabriel is always that little extra charge for the Texas offense. Although there is depth, the pool shrinks with the transfer of Ashley Shook. How does this affect the team? Well, Ashley Shook is a captain and has been with the Longhorns since she was a freshman. 
So it's always hard losing a leader and someone who has played a role in the team for so long, but the Longhorns have a lot of depth. And when Shook struggled her sophomore year, that's when Jenna Gabriel took over that starting position and has been really impactful as the starting setter. So it's sad to lose a captain and leader for the Longhorns, but Texas is well equipped moving forward with a deep roster and starting lineup. Absolutely. It's always hard when you have a player like Ashley Shook, who's been with the program for a long time and she contributes a great deal. Thankfully, Jenna Gabriel has done an excellent job filling in the setter role. It's been smooth sailing through the Big 12 so far, but the Horns are now facing their biggest test. After a bye week, they face number two Baylor and Waco. These two teams have been at the top of the Big 12 for the past two years. How do these factors influence the highly anticipated matchup? Yeah, well, there's no doubt it's going to be a tough game between the Longhorns and the Bears. Last time Texas played Baylor, Texas lost in five sets. The time before that, Texas won in three sets. So it's always a very competitive matchup, which you can expect from the top two teams. And both Texas and Baylor have momentum going for them this season. Texas is on a 10-game win streak. Baylor is on a nine-game win streak. But like you said earlier, Texas will be coming off of a bye week. So it'll be crucial for them to come out strong and find their rhythm quickly. But the Longhorns have been performing at such a high level this whole season that I think they're in good shape to take on Baylor even after a week off. Hannah, it's going to be one of the best matchups in all of college volleyball this season. The two biggest arch rivals in the Big 12 going at it. We're all looking forward to it. Good to see you again, and thanks for the great analysis. Stay tuned for the World Series alongside two of the wildest games in the NFL and college football. Welcome back. This weekend was berserk. Both college football and the NFL had two wild games unfold. The World Series heated up as well. Here's Thomas Fitch with more. Thanks, Clark. You're absolutely right. Today on Unhooked, we are looking at the very best games and the best plays from what was just a wild weekend of sports. So let's get into it. Game one, we're looking at from game three of Rays against the Dodgers. Top three, Corey Seager. Talk about the season and postseason he's had. He goes deep. That's his eighth home run of the postseason. Just incredible numbers he's been putting up. So the Dodgers going to take the early 2-0 lead. Now we're in the bottom of the fifth. Hunter Renfro, not the guy for the Raiders, but the guy for the Rays. And they're cutting back into the lead, 3-2. Now bottom six, that's Brandon Lowe. He's going to go deep. That's going to score three runs. So now the Rays are up five to four. Top eight, Corey Seager again. He's doing it all. He's going to get the bloop single. That's going to score runs. So heading to the bottom of the ninth, Dodgers are leading. But here we go, bottom of the ninth, Brett Phillips single. Air number one. So uh, Kiermaier, Kim Kiermaier are going to come in and score. The throw coming home, but it's going to be missed by Will Smith. That's Ara Zarina. He's going to come in. And we'll take another look. The throw was there. They had him, but Will Smith just misses it. Talk about a wild walk-off. That tied up the series. Dodgers obviously got the win. The outside takes the 3-2 lead. Now, Cardinals and Seahawks, another crazy game. So fourth quarter, Russell Wilson going to find Tyler Lockett in the corner of the end zone. Crazy catch. Watch this. Barely gets the two feet in, but does. So the Seahawks lead by 10, but Harkle storming back. Kyler Murray going to find uh, Christian Kirk. Seahawks went three and out. So the Cardinals drive down. How much chance to tie it up? Zane Gonzalez just barely sneaks it in. So we are headed to overtime. In overtime, Seahawks got the ball first, but the Cardinals get the stop, which means all the Cardinals need is a field goal. Chase Edmonds going to take the Cardinals into field goal territory, but we're going to get an interesting decision here by Clint Kingsbury. Second down, two, a little over two and a half minutes left. They're going to kick the field goal, and they miss. So the Seahawks getting the ball back. DK Metcalf looks like he's going to make the most of it, running down the sidelines for the touchdown. 
or is it? There's a flag on the play holding. So we're gonna do this all over again. And Isaiah Simmons is gonna pick off Russell Wilson. So Zane Gonzalez is gonna get another chance at redemption, 48 yards, and he does just that. Cardinals get the win, Seahawks no longer undefeated. I'm sure Zane Gonzalez felt a little relieved after that. Final game, Penn State and Indiana. We'll start here in the fourth quarter against Penn State. Going to take the lead on this pass from Sean Clifford. They're going to stop Indiana. So all they need to do is run out the clock. But Devin Ford forgets about that and scores. So Indiana actually going to have a chance to get back in this game. And Michael Penix Jr. is going to take it himself in for the score. Now Indiana still needs to get the two-point conversion if they want a chance of extending the game. But Penix Jr. going to do it with his feet again. So 28 all. Headed to overtime right. Well, maybe not just quite yet. A weird play looked like Indiana trying to swim it there. So a 57-yard attempt. This one by Jordan Stout. And misses by no more than a yard. So we are actually headed to overtime. First possession for Penn State. Sean Clifford going to find Parker Washington. So Indiana needs to find a score here. And Penix Jr. going to find Watt Filor in the corner of the end zone. But Indiana going for the win. Penix Jr. diving for the goal line. They would review this play for about five minutes. But after review, they rule it as a touchdown. Indiana, their first top 10 win in more than 41 years. Unreal there for the Penn State Nitty Lions. All right, now let's head and look at the top 10 plays from the weekend. Number 10, Travis Etienne. Spinning, guy's a human highlight reel. And for the, the score there, Clemson ended up beating Syracuse. Number nine, might have already seen this play. One of the more wild plays from this week. And Buda Baker intercepts Russell Wilson, but DK Metcalf in a foot race and stops Buda Baker from scoring. Incredible speed by DK. Number eight, Brandon Lowe going deep, but Mookie Betts, he's been making defense look easy. He made this catch look as easy as possible you can see from this angle a little tougher than than he made it look number seven again Cardinals Seahawks Kyler Murray looking for DeAndre Hopkins finds him in the corner but watch this you can see Kyler Murray he smiles he sees Hopkins in man coverage throws it up and lets Hopkins do the rest there on the touchdown number six Hassan Haskins for Michigan breaks some tackles early on now running down the sideline doesn't score but it's going to take two Minnesota defenders getting each leg to finally bring him down number five this one not from a player but from a fan in Dodgers Rays game pretty incredible catching watch this as it comes around the net and the fan makes a pretty nice grab there number four Jordan Travis, quarterback for Florida State, going to bobble the snap, but dribbles it up to himself, jukes out two Louisville defenders, and dives into the end zone for just a wild touchdown run. Let's take another look. He, I mean, it's a little crossover there that he does with the ball. Jukes out the defenders and scores. Louisville would win that one big, though. Number three, Trey Palmer, the returner for LSU, is going to bobble it, pick it back up, no momentum, but watch this. Watch how quick he turns on the Jets. Gets the kicker, gets the last return man around the side, past the 50, and nobody else from the Gamecocks are going to get him. He takes that one to the house, and LSU ends up winning this one big. Number two, end of the Browns, Bengals, Baker Mayfield to Donovan Peoples-Jones, the go-ahead touchdown, and the Browns would win that. Number one, though, Justin Fields. Corner of the end zone to Jackson Smith and Jigba. At first, they ruled it incomplete, but let's take another look at that. The body control to get his foot back in. What a catch there by Njigba. Clark, wild weekend. That's all the, all the highlights. I think that's about all the highlights you could get, but I'll send it back over to you. It was a wild weekend indeed. Justin Fields looking very good, and that Indiana play is one that will live in infamy. Thanks again, Thomas. Great stuff.
When we come back, past Longhorns are making their mark in the NFL. Check back in and watch them make a splash on the big stage. Welcome back to College Press Box. Let's look at some Longhorns making some big contributions in the NFL. Keandre Diggs had a huge interception for the Seahawks against the Cardinals. Kenny Baccaro, an All-American at UT, chased down James Conner for the big tackle right here. And speaking of big tackles, Adrian Phillips wraps up George Kittle, preventing him from walking into the end zone. This past Friday, Texas soccer fell to Oklahoma State 2-0. Longhorns outshot the 12th ranked Cowboys 11 to 9, but Oklahoma State converted more opportunities, scoring in the 12th and 60th minute. The Longhorns are now 3 and 4. Next up is the Horns matchup against Baylor on October 30th at Mike Myers Stadium. Last Thursday and Friday, Texas men's tennis competed in the ITA Regionals in Waco. The Horns won 6 of 8 doubles matches on Friday. Senior Peyton Holden, junior Nevin Armilly, sophomore Jacob Bullard, and freshman Micah Braswell all advanced to the quarterfinals and singles play. The Horns will hit the court again on November 6th at the Big Six Fall Invitational in Fort Worth. Women's tennis also headed to Waco for the HEB shootout against Baylor. The Horns earned two wins on Friday. They added three more wins on Saturday. Freshman Peyton Stearns won her fourth consecutive match. Freshman Relika Mapalu is 7-0 in singles play this fall. Seniors Fernanda Labrana and Marta perez Mur earned singles victories as well. The Horns will head to Tyler next for the ITF 80K tournament. The Cats and Longhorns are primed and ready to battle on the hardwood. This week, the schedule for the annual Big 12 SEC Challenge was announced. The Longhorns will travel to Lexington, Kentucky on January 30th to battle the Wildcats. This is only the third matchup in history between the two schools. The last time was December 5th, 2014, when top-ranked Kentucky earned a 63-51 victory over the Longhorns. The Longhorns tip off against UTRGV on November 25th. Big 12 play commences against Baylor on December 13th. After the hire of Vic Schaefer and the return of Charlie Collier, expectations are high for Texas women's basketball. The Big 12 coaches poll picked the Longhorns to finish second overall behind Baylor. The poll was conducted by every coach in the Big 12, and Texas received 73 points overall. Women's basketball also announced their schedule this week. They open up against SMU on November 25th. Notable out-of-conference games include Texas A&M on December 6th and Tennessee on December 13th. The Horns open up Big 12 play against Kansas on December 17th. They played the 2019 national champions, the Baylor Bears, on Valentine's Day in Frank Irwin Center and again in Waco on March 1st. This week in Longhorn Sports, on Tuesday, both the men's and women's golf teams will compete in round two of the East Lake Cup in Atlanta, and that can be seen on the Golf Channel. The ITF Tyler ADK Tournament in Tyler, Texas started today for women's tennis and will continue tomorrow through Sunday. On Friday, both the men's, women's, and swimming and diving teams will compete against Texas A&M at 4.30 p.m. in Austin. Also on Friday, track and field will compete at the Big 12 Championships in Lawrence, Kansas. The last Friday competition will be soccer against the Baylor Bears at 7 p.m. in Austin, and that can be seen on LHN. Lastly, this Saturday, football will take on the Oklahoma State Cowboys in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and that can be seen on Fox at 3. That's a wrap for tonight's show. Be sure to tune in to our other shows, College Crossfire with host Jaxie Pigeon on Wednesday nights at 9, and the 1-0 Sports Show on Friday mornings. From all of us at the Sports Department, thank you and good night.